Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor uh, and a joy to be here tonight. And uh, uh, this is a lecture, so uh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's even better. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So it's an honor for us to be here tonight and to be invited. Uh, it's a lecture, uh, approximately an hour, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I don't have a reading, say, uh, but something like that. And uh, basically, I start and uh, uh, tell a story. It's not an academic lecture, it's a lecture of our life story, but it has some, uh, uh, maybe some academic lines in it. <laughs> uh, it's um, uh, a story that is over uh, 15 years. I'll do, I will start and then read my wife. That will come up, and after that, uh, I will let it finish it. Uh, when we, my wife, Brigitte, and myself announced publicly that we would become Catholics, which was the 9th of March 2014, uh, it was uh, at the end of a long, outgrown process of many years. I was passed from a charismatic, non denominational of the church in life in Uppsala, Sweden, uh, that was founded in 1980 and had grown over the years and now had a large network of congregations in many nations. We have been heavily involved in missions and church planting and uh, taking many initiatives and done, done many different outreaches, uh, starting Christian schools in Sweden and also elsewhere, uh, Bible schools in different nations, started uh, different publications and pioneered in Christian media. This had been our lives and our passion for over 30 years. To stand on the platform in our 4,000 seat church building in Uppsala and to announce that we would be Catholics uh, would for some be like a sudden tsunami. For others, it was, a suspicions, it was suspicions that were coming true after all. And for others, when it was a little bit better, uh, it was something that they understood uh, must come at last. So as you understand, it was diverse reactions. This was the end of a long development that had been going on for about 15 years. Uh, it was not a hasty decision, uh, even though for many it came as a big surprise, and for some even as a shock. After completing my studies in 1979, I was ordained a Lutheran minister in Uppsala, and I became a chaplain at the University of Uppsala, uh, the city where we lived. This gave me an opportunity to continue to do what I had done throughout my studies, and that was to lead Bible studies and to evangelize, especially among, me, among students. And I really, really loved doing that. During this period, we decided to take a year off and to study more about the charismatic life. Uh, we did it in a charismatic Bible school in the United States. This, for us, was a step of faith, uh, and we had to trust the Lord for our provision during that year. Uh, and we learned a lot about um, Christian, the Christian life, and especially the charismatic life, that you never were taught at a secular state university. Coming back to Sweden, we eventually started a Bible school that was open for all denominations, all Christians. And we became heavily involved in this new ministry called Word of Life. Eventually, I resigned as a Lutheran pastor, uh, as our activities involved church planting, and our models were more and more formed by Pentecostal charismatic models rather than Lutheran. Uh, the uh, ministry, the Bible school, and the newly started local congregation grew. Uh, many people, mainly young, were attracted. And we started to send out evangelistic teams and eventually sending missionaries to a, a number of nations. At, the, at this time, and now we're in the end of the 80s, uh, the Iron Curtain collapsed, and uh, us being about two hours from Moscow, uh, we were automatically engaged heavily in missions into the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union that eventually became the former Soviet Union, and also to the Eastern European countries. It was an amazing time with an unprecedented opening for the gospel into these communist nations, and it filled us with uh, joy and with purpose as we shuffled in and out for many years, actually, pre 
preaching and teaching. And we saw thousands of people uh, turning to Jesus Christ, there were new, new congregations being built, and also many Bible schools that were started. During this adventurous and very, very busy time, uh, I was in, in Albania. And in Albania, uh, which is, this was in the beginning of the 90s, and we had an unusual opening as I was able to preach at the main stadium in Tirana, the capital uh, of Albania. Uh, it was a time when there was still a communist uh, uh, president, of course, and, and, and a communist government. Uh, but there was also a few Democrats that had been put in. Albania being the last of the uh, Eastern uh, countries that, uh, that still needed to communism and they eventually fell. The meeting uh, was aired by state television uh, even before the communist regime had fallen, so evidently they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> it was amazing to see how people responded to the gospel and how clearly there was such a hunger for Jesus Christ. After one of these events, uh, this one uh, I'm telling about now occurred uh, after the fall of the communist regime. We went in several times. And I met the new president-to-be and his secretary. His secretary was very glad and happy to meet me. And he came up and greeted me. And he had obviously been in these meetings that we had held. And he greeted me with these words, I am also a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> now, this jolted me a bit. <laughs> And I thought, uh, I'm not a Catholic, I'm a Protestant. And in my mind, these thoughts raced very quickly. In justification, I'm Lutheran. In holiness, I'm more of a Methodist. In baptism, more of a Baptist, but not just a Baptist, because I do believe baptism is more than a symbol. It also confers the Holy Spirit. In believing in the Holy Spirit, I guess I'm more like a Pentecostal. Uh, but not just a Pentecostal, I'm also charismatic. <laughs> Uh, all this, which is really the history of the developments and divisions in the body of Christ, was racing through my mind in a few seconds. And uh, as I clearly did not know at all how to communicate all that that was going on in my mind as he greeted me saying, I'm also Catholic, the only thing I could say to him was, uh, God bless you, brother. <laughs> in this moment that I was certainly not in the center of what we call the church, but more on the outskirts, influenced as we were by divisions and constant new movements who splintered from one another. And although I had seen a lot of wonderful things, I realized I was still part of these divisions. And I knew enough of what the Bible is teaching on the subject of unity to understand that this is not the fullness of what Jesus wanted from the church. So from this moment, something started to grow in me that I uh, really hadn't uh, expected, but it, uh, uh, it stuck there, and it remained there. It was a question of unity. Now, what is Christian unity? It had occupied me uh, when I started theology, but now, a uh, number of years later, uh, I hadn't thought that much of it. it. From that instant, it started to become a living reality, something that challenged me, something that also bothered me, and something that I didn't have the solution to, uh, and I think few people have. A number of years, uh, I've also encountered a, no a number of more or less difficulties in different parts of our very broad mission work. And that led me to start to look for needed answers to these questions. This was questions about authenticity in leadership, about the need of some form of teaching authority, authority or, or authoritative magisterium, although I did not use that term at that time, uh, but some form of teaching authority in theological problems, in moral problems, and the question was who had the right to decide uh, what was right and what was wrong, and on what basis could we decide uh, what is actually right and wrong, especially uh, if we read the same Bible and come to different conclusions. How are pastors to put into office? Can anybody just call themselves a pastor if they want to, and start a group if they want to? And uh, in what relation do they stand to be able to be helped? and to be corrected when things are being rough or where things are going wrong. Because
because it seems when everything is going right, uh, that the model that we were in, and the, which is prevalent also in, in, in these circles, uh, the independent and the congregational uh, ecclesiological view, seem rather good, practical, pragmatic, and effective. But when things start to go wrong, uh, who could interfere, and with what authority? These reflections uh, was not theoretical reflection for me. They were actual experiences in several places, uh, in our mission's work uh, that led me to start to study and reflect deeper about what and really who the church really is. These thoughts uh, stuck in my mind and uh, seemed, seemed constantly to challenge me. It was like the Lord was urging me with these words, get to know the essence of the church. Uh, I felt compelled to search not just for the most effective strategies, uh, the uh, best activities for the church, the different types of models for mission, uh, key uh, and very practical ways of doing evangelization, the building up of different congregations, uh, the worship, the outreaches, ministry for children and for grown-ups, and so on. All this vast work that you have uh, if you do uh, church work and missions work. Uh, instead, getting deeper to know and trying to, to find out what is the very essence of the church. What and who is the church? I realized more and more how weak I actually was in what we call ecclesiological understanding and how pragmatic and in many ways quite shallow my understand, uh, understanding of the church actually was. This led me to uh, start to gradually change some of my ideas. Ideas that was prevalent within our particular Christian circles uh, and in many uh, surrounding circles, I would say, in the Free Church Movement, Pentecostal, and, and, and Charismatic Movement all over the world. And uh, these were also ideas that I, which I had really haven't fully or deeply reflected on, uh, but still believe and taught. Uh, and I can see among these uh, I uh, ideas, or rather, maybe say, attitudes that are underlying the ideas that we have, um, it was attitudes of um, a definite disdain about the past. Progress, growth, visions for the future occupied us at the expense of tradition and going back to sources in history. And even though I personally loved history and studied it, it was one of my majors at university, uh, there was still uh, a lack, a lack of uh, understanding of Christian history in that sense. It was also a lack of respect for any form of institution, uh, as it was seen more or less as a threat to evangelical and spiritual freedom. A suspicion about leadership and its perceived abuse was prevalent. And uh, the idea of obedience was never a very popular concept. <laughs> I think it still now is in many places. Uh, I did see, of course, the need of leadership. Uh, I even wrote a book about it. Uh, in our charismatic culture, authority was often viewed uh, at all as a hindrance to, initiative, to the initiatives of the ordinary believer, the, the lay man. Uh, we probably, probably use the term believer and lay man. It was a common priesthood, and everybody agreed on that, reading the Bible, but uh, not really a special priesthood. At least definitely not special priesthood in any high church sense or in a Catholic sense of the word. So step by step, I started to see the need uh, of all these things, uh, that these were things that we had actually uh, consciously or unconsciously rejected during our work and our, I would say, busy work that we were doing. Uh, it seems that these things were needed after all. I started to study more about the history, about the continuity, about the authenticity, about the authority, and about the sacramentality of the church. Uh, these words, of course, uh, were words that we uh, not really used. Uh, we looked at history, as I mentioned before, uh, many times as something that was on a, on a lower level, going constantly progressing upward. Uh, so why should you then look back? 
the continuity is also something that, that was not really taken uh, carefully because all the abrupt changes that go on, uh, it, become, it, it becomes more of normality than something odd. Authenticity, I mean, which deals with, is this a true and proper service? Is this a true uh, and proper ministry and office? Uh, authority, where is the authority? Yes, it's in the Word of God, it's in the Bible. Is there an authority uh, in ministry, in, in office? Uh, is there, where is the uh, authority in the church itself? Uh, so these questions open up a whole vista of, of um, uh, things that I had not fully uh, penetrated, uh, but really became a, a, a discovery, uh, step by step, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so really, uh, it was here we f I found, really found answers that I was looking for, although I first didn't want to admit that. Uh, I started to see that many of the activities we had engaged in, they were good, uh, absolutely. Uh, they were needed, of course, uh, but still uh, they were not enough. And uh, we did not, and this is uh, the conclusion, I started to realize that we actually did not have to invent the wheel in every new generation. Continuity was actually stronger than discontinuity. And uh, we were supposed to build on something that was before us, and not just depart from it or disdain it as old fashioned, out of time, or dead. This, uh, for me, was a very sobering and uncomfortable challenge. Uh, but also, in the end, very enriching and uh, uh, very <coughs> satisfying because of all the riches we started to discover, uh, this was something that uh, really solved many of our problems. Uh, even more comfortable at this time was the fact that the answers, because I was looking for this and I was studying this and I was uh, chasing it, not out of just theoretical interest, but because uh, I needed tools to add to uh, uh, solve uh, really uh, concrete down to earth problems. Uh, problems that will arise in, in, I think, in any congregation, in any church system. Uh, so, anyway, uh, the problem I had was when I found a good answer, uh, it was in a source that I really didn't wish to turn to. It was the Catholic Church. Uh, the problem I had when I went to the library or when I went on, on, on the net, when I found something that was really, really useful, it was 99% it was a Catholic author. Uh, and that bothered me a little bit because, and I have to go back and say a little bit about the background. Of course, in, as you probably well aware of, uh, Sweden uh, was, a, was a very staunch Protestant nation. And uh, from the Reformation and on, there's virtually been any Catholics in Sweden up until the But uh, as you probably also know, it took all the way up to 1951 without a law that, uh, that gave uh, Sweden religious freedom. That is rather late, I would say, for other uh, for modern European nations. And after 1970, uh, it was not possible to start a, a Catholic monastery. It was forbidden by law. So uh, of course, we have a, a background uh, where uh, uh, in school, people in our Christian environment, even in our studies, uh, where we seldom encountered uh, Catholics, uh, didn't see uh, much of them, or really encountered Catholic theology. Uh, instead, uh, we thought that we knew, that we knew, that we knew, and passed on what others thought that they knew, and uh, that became uh, sometimes uh, just lack of knowledge, sometimes uh, ignorance, or sometimes prejudices, or sometimes myths. And in this process, this is uh, where my soul searching was. I started to realize that how sure am I that uh, what is the basis for my opinion uh, in these matters? And I realized that I was rather shallow. I didn't have uh, really the answers. And here, answers are coming to me uh, from a source that I really didn't want to uh, uh, investigate. So I'm right in this dilemma. I'm going to end here now, and I will uh, ask my wife to come and continue. 
and tell it from her story. The book that we have written uh, is uh, kind of two-sided in a way. We talk about the same thing. I do one chapter, she does another, then I do the second, the next one, and we go back and forth like that. But we do it from different angles, because we see them differently. Uh, we come to the same conclusion, so it all ends well. So uh, it's not a tragedy, it's a comedy. <laughs>
Later, you know that in life, Birgitta had many, many revelations of Jesus and also of Mary. Birgitta is considered the greatest Swedish author of the Middle Ages. One thing that especially impressed me about her was that when she was an adult, she was very, very careful not to be spiritually led astray. She always hurried to her confessor, her priest, in order to be sure that what she had heard or seen in her revelations was not a delusion from the devil. She said that um, however powerful the revelation might seem to her, she would rather die than declare something that was not in line with scripture and Christian doctrine. This gave me a great respect for her. I was at this time rather tired of not so careful at uh, not, not so careful attitude among charismatic Protestants when it comes to personal revelations and spiritual ideas. I have to confess now that as a charismatic Protestant, I did not expect this deep knowledge of the scriptures from a Catholic. This is how little I knew at this point in time. And this is unfortunately how many evangelical people think even today. Naturally, there was one thing that was difficult for me to understand at this point, and that was St. Pilita's deep and concrete relationship to the Virgin Mary. I did believe that the Gita's supernatural experiences were inspired by God. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. But what about all of, all of this about Mary? It was difficult for me to accept that one could speak to Mary, or that Mary would have such an active role as she seemed to have in St. Gita's life. Also, as an evangelical Christian, I considered the Virgin Mary to be a blessed and venerable person, but as I saw it then, she had died and was now in heaven, and her mission was completed. Protestants teach that we shall not speak to the dead, as you know. So this living relationship between the Gita and Mary became a problem to me. I could not put it all together, especially since I knew how careful St. Gita was with theology and the right doctrine. So I had to keep searching for the answers. There was especially one theological truth that, I had, never, that had never been explained to me in my Protestant world. <coughs> If Jesus was born of a woman, even by a miraculous virgin birth, how could he escape being contaminated by original sin? I knew and believed that there was, of course, no sin in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So the big question for me was, how could Jesus, if he was born of a woman out of sin for the humanity, be flesh of her flesh, and still remain free from sin. Was he not truly Mary's son? Of course he was. We all believe this. So obviously there was something about the Virgin Mary that I didn't know. Something that nobody talks about in the evangelical charismatic world, at least uh, as far as I experienced. This is happening to me during our three years in Israel, where we lived 2002 to 2005. And this is about 10 years before we actually are received in the Catholic Church. In Israel, we had many good encounters with Jews and with Catholics, and it was so good for us. The meaning of tradition that Ruth has talked about now became so clear to us when we observe these Jews and the Catholics. Also the priesthood and the magisterium. 
I really long for, for trusting a, a, a reliable teaching office. I, really, I realized more and more that I was prejudiced against the Catholic faith and that I was judging it without really knowing enough about it. And I felt ashamed when I saw this because we had ourselves been treated with much prejudice from the Swedish media, for instance, and this had been a suffering for us. And now I saw that I was treating the Catholics in the same unjust way. This forced me to keep studying good Catholic books about the Catholic faith and search for the answers concerning the Virgin Mary, especially about this immaculate conception. One day I finally found it. I read St. John Paul II's encyclical, Redemptoris Mater, the Mother of the Redeemer. And this is the passage I read. He says, and you can also find it in the, <coughs> and, uh, the Catechism. By virtue of the rich, richness of grace of the beloved Son, by reason of the redemptive merits of him, Jesus, who willed to become her son, Mary was preserved from the inheritance of original sin. And it also says the election of Mary is holy, exceptional, and unique. Totally ex 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 exceptional and unique. Now I understood Mary is so highly favored, as the angel Gabriel said, because God let her benefit from Jesus' work of redemption already at the moment of her conception, when she was formed in her mother's womb. This came as a surprise to me. Big news. I understood that, like us, Mary has been redeemed by the blood of her son, Jesus. Just as Ephesians 1, 7 says, I quote, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So Mary shared in this grace of salvation beforehand God gave this grace to Mary at the moment of her conception. Because of this great, amazing mission she had, he had for her in his plan of salvation. The child she would give birth to, the savior of the world, was also her savior. And without him, she would be, she would be lost, just like we. When I, when I saw and understood how the Catholic Church explains the important place of Mary, all the pieces of the puzzle came together regarding this important question, and I was very happy. And I also said to Ulf, how come we have not heard this before? We have never heard this explanation. Why? Why has nobody told us? that this is the way Catholics believe. And I often thought, there seems to be an iron curtain between us and the Catholics. It is said that the Virgin Mary is such a great stumbling block to so many evangelical Christians. I believe this has to change. And Ulf's and my desire is that we by the grace of God, we'll be able to help others to see and understand the Catholic Church and also Mary's vital role in God's great plan of salvation. We have written more extensively, this is a, just a short glimpse, about how we struggled with the doctrines and traditions of the Catholic Church in this book that you saw, The Great Discovery. 
Yes, our spiritual journey was a wonderful way of many, many beautiful discoveries and blessings. And I am so thankful for that. The Lord is so patient with us, so loving. When we honestly search for the truth and want to hear his voice and follow him. And here I will let you continue this story. As we've heard uh, many stories of uh, uh, evangelicals and Protestants being Catholic, uh, we testimonies, we've many times have heard that Mary was the hardest nut to crack, so to speak, and that it came last. Uh, everything else was solved, but then there was still this with Mary. So for us, it was a little bit different. It was like Mary came first. She came right in our face. And it was like, if we cannot understand her, then we cannot understand anything else about the Catholic Church. Uh, we started to, uh, I started to understand that uh, uh, finding answers uh, from Catholic sources was not just a, a pragmatic way of uh, fixing my ecclesiological problems, but it was more of a drawing into something that was actually entirely different. A picture that the Lord was painting for us uh, about what and who the church is. Also understood, uh, and I, but I will not go into that now, as uh, has touched on it a little bit, and it's more in the book, that uh, the whole question about Mary was not about Mary. It was about Jesus. It was about Jesus Christ. That, uh, he, the, the, even the doctrines or, or the dogmas about Mary, uh, safeguarded the uh, uh, humanity and the divinity of Christ. Because without the divinity of Christ, and without the humanity of Christ, we would be lost. So this was very important dogmatic issues, of course, not just uh, something pragmatic. So at this time, we were sent from Word of Life to uh, uh, start a study center in Israel, in Jerusalem. And we eventually moved to the little village of En Kerem, which is on the outskirts of Jerusalem. En Kerem is the village of John the Baptist, where he was born, and the meeting place uh, of Elizabeth and Mary. And for us, it also became a meeting place with Mary. Uh, it was no escaping. Uh, anyway, when, uh, we, uh, when we were there, uh, <coughs> We started to understand that we have to have much more respect for our spiritual roots and uh, also for the continuity of the faith. And we discovered so much. Uh, it, it is a place, as if you've been to Jerusalem, uh, you know that it, it is also a place of the division of the body of Christ. It's very, very concrete there, very evident and also very painful. Uh, <clears throat> so the whole question about unity became very tangible and very concrete for us as we lived there for three years. But wherever we were uh, in Israel, especially in Jerusalem, we bumped into Catholics. Uh, they seemed to be around every corner. Uh, and, and this was so different, of course, from Uppsala, where you can live for 20, 30 years without meeting a single one. Uh, so it's quite, it's quite a different story. Uh, in Sweden, we rarely had met them. But here they were everywhere. And they were nice, and they were loving. And what we saw, the first thing we saw that uh, really surprised us is was how much they loved Jesus Christ. It was such a, a uh, it, te it tells us a little bit about prejudices. We're talking about our prejudices. We're not saying that every Protestant has, every evangelical, every charismatic has these prejud prejudices. We say that we have uh, and we did. Uh, and, and, and the love that the shine or that was so visible in the people of the Catholics that we met uh, really, really made a strong impression on us. <clears throat> well, we had the usual question. We had the same questions as everybody else, of course. And uh, this was the question about what about the Pope? Uh, what about Mary? We mentioned that. What about the saints? And what about pur purgatory? Now, these questions were rooted in our Protestant belief of the Sola Scriptura, which is one of the Reformation principles, uh, the scripture alone, Skrift and Aliena, which we uh, naturally believe it comes with a bath of water, so to speak. Uh, and uh, step by step, I started to see 
And I was not alone in this, uh, together with other charismatic theologians as well, started to see that Sola Scriptura was not really so scriptural after all. It, it is a slogan, it is, it's a nice catchphrase, but uh, actually you never find it in the Bible. Uh, step by step I started to see that uh, when Catholics spoke about tradition, and the Catholics talked about the church and the Pope, then they did not put uh, tradition, church or Pope before the Bible. This was the idea that we had, that they did, they, they substituted scripture for Pope, uh, church and tradition. And we started to understand that, that this was not so at all. Uh, it was not so that Catholics never had read the Bible. Uh, it was not even so that the Catholic Church had tried to withhold the Bible from their own people or the world at large. These were myths that were rolling and going, and they're quite uh, they're frequent uh, still. Uh, and and uh, so, to my shame, I started to see that here are some myths that more or less con unconsciously uh, we had swallowed them and inherited them uh, from times past. Uh, instead of sola scriptura, I started to understand there was another term better used and much more in line with the scripture and how the ancient church, the original church, uh, the first church, all these uh, phrases that we usually used, actually understood scripture. And that is the term, the primacy of scripture, uh, which means uh, that we all share, that we believe the Bible. Uh, no question, we believe the Bible, we believe that it is God's word. But uh, the question is not just if it is God's word, but how do you read it? How do you use it? What are the tools so that you properly understand it? And here is what I believe true tradition, tradition with a big T, uh, comes in. Uh, that tradition is actually basically the key in how we read the scriptures or how Scripture was read in the early days in the church fathers, the distant fathers, as the church grew. And uh, also, uh, it made me see that there is a definite need of a teaching office, a magisterium, uh, a magisterium, who uh, could, because we would usually say, well, we believe the Bible, well, uh, how do you interpret it? Well, the Holy Spirit will help us. The problematic, this is uh, true, it is true. But the question is, how is the Holy Spirit doing this? The question is, if you have um, 10 denominations uh, gathered, or 15, or 20, or 13 movements, or 100, or 150 movements, or we can go on. Uh, and, and then you start to see the differences in interpretation, and the differences is understanding. We could say, well, that's nice plurality, and that's the, the many four graces of God. The problem is when you come to uh, uh, opposition and when you come to uh, different meanings or taking away or changing the, uh, the understanding of scripture, who is to decide who has the right interpretation? Uh, can you only go by the inner witness, which was usually what Calvin was referring to, uh, or can you go only to that anybody can read the same uh, the, the, the scriptures for themselves, that it is only I, uh, myself, Jesus, and the Bible, and that is enough. Now, I am here, that's for sure. Jesus is my Savior, yes, absolutely. The Bible is here, but is that enough? Uh, no, it's not, and it also um, goes back to a, uh, a, a different understanding of what the church really is and what the purpose of the church is. So I started to see more and more uh, that, um, the, that the same Lord that gave us the scriptures gave us also an able under, way of understanding the scripture and that the scriptures are supposed to be read in and through the church and that there is a, a, a teaching office that also helps us uh, to uh, get a deeper understanding so that uh, the deposit of objective truth and revelation that has been deposited in the church will be safeguarded and handed over to coming generations. During this time, we had a number of opportunities to travel, and um, some of the travels took us to Rome, and Rome actually made a deep impression, uh, impression on us. We've been a lot in Jerusalem, of course, and in other places in the world. The first time we went to Rome was 1999, 
And we went there because we needed education. We went there to look at some churches, ancient monuments, visiting cafes, drinking cappuccino, uh, eating pasta, you know. And, and uh, it was nice. <laughs> Rome is very nice. An awful lot of churches. Uh, and, and many statues of Mary. Uh, first time I was there, I was a little bit, and I was wondering right, that this is a little bit too much. <laughs> On a Wednesday audience, now we're going back in time a little bit, this is 1999, uh, Wednesday we uh, heard that the Pope would come to uh, St. Peter's Square. Uh, we, of course, had no experience of this. Uh, we ran to the square, I think he got some tickets or something, we got in there, and we came very close to one of these uh, 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 little gay streets that they make up in uh, when the Pope comes with his Pope and being on the square and the people sit there. So we were, uh, we actually, he came just by us like this. As he was coming by, this was John Paul II at that time, uh, my happy wife uh, just greeted him by shouting loud, God bless you, brother. <laughs> and uh, I really, I realized I was, I wasn't quite sure he was a brother. <laughs> now, is he a brother or not? And when I discovered that thought, that I actually didn't, I wasn't sure that he was a brother. Something came in my conscience that made me feel ashamed. So I corrected myself and thought, well, of course he has a brother, you know, but as we Protestants probably know, would have been better certain things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if this was the idea to have. Anyway, as, I was, as I'm thinking this, a person appears that I haven't seen before, he just next to me, he's a young man, and he does, he does not introduce himself. He just turns to me like if he read my thoughts. And he just looks at me and says, who? is the Holy Father for you. And I'm like, well, I talk very diplomatic, which doesn't happen very often. Well. <laughs> and I said, well, he is the Bishop of Rome. And then he turned to me again, and he looked at me with his serious eyes. And he said, is that all he is? And I really had no answer. At all. I felt caught. I clearly felt very uneasy. I was at a bad conscience because I sensed that I had a bad attitude and, and uh, that I had some resistance in me. I knew instantly that the Lord was trying to tell me something. So, what uh, we uh, trying to say tonight is that we studied a lot, we wanted to know. Uh, because of what Brigitte said before, we, we knew people that thought they knew things about us, our movement, our church, and ourselves. But they never listened to us, never read us, never uh, went into any details at all, only read what the newspapers, secular newspapers would say. And now we feel that we are doing the same mistake. We really, really never studied this from Catholic sources. Because actually we were warned that Catholic sources is very prejudiced. We were not warned that Protestant sources would be prejudiced against Catholics, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Anyway, so uh, one way of coming closer to the Catholic Church was definitely studying the sources, studying what the, Catholic, what the Catholics say about themselves. And we were surprised because it did not uh, line up with our opinions and, and the myths that we were carrying. Uh, the other thing was that we had from time to time certain experiences. And they will take a long time, I don't have time to, to give all these experiences. But this was one experience that I mentioned, this young man. Then later when I was uh, turned around to talk to him, he was gone. I, mean, I don't know where he, this guy went, I haven't seen him since. But what he said definitely stayed with me. I knew that I knew that I didn't know really who the whole father the Pope was. I just thought, anyway, uh, we, we traveled from when we were in Israel, a little later, from 2002 to 2005, we several times uh, traveled to Rome. And we did it more and more. A few years later, we were in St. Peter's uh, Church and had the opportunity to go down into Skavi. Skavi is like a, a churchyard or, or a, really like a little city of the dead underneath uh, St. Peter's Dome. 
and that was excavated, I think, in the in the 20s, 1920s or 30s, uh, and quite recently that is. And uh, these are the graves that are under the church. And uh, uh, as we toured it, uh, the tour guide said, and here underneath are the bones of Saint Peter. Uh, they have been discovered, and. Uh, uh, a uh, few of them are, are, are still here. And if you look through that little hole, she said, you can actually see them. Uh, I looked through that hole, and there was something there, small pieces of bone there, and, and it just kind of shook me that that could possibly, I mean, I was skeptical, I'm honest, I was very skeptical, but it could possibly be, actually, just logically, be the bones from the Apostle Peter. And in some way that I cannot explain, it, uh, uh, it really uh, hooked me up to something which is continuity. Uh, now, we walk the staircase up, and when you come up, you come to the main altar, uh, and, uh, which is uh, huge and very beautiful. And as we wa walked up, we realized that this grave, uh, where the bones were, or the fragments, uh, of the bones were, is just underneath the main altar. And <coughs> like, uh, uh, in my mind, I, I, it's not that I was trying to think it, it just came. It was like a connection. There is a connection here. Uh, St. Peter and his martyrdom uh, in Rome. Uh, he could very well be buried here. And then his successors through the years, all the way up to now. Uh, this made me understand also better Matthew 16, which I had preached a lot on. Matthew 16, I would constantly refer to it uh, because, uh, as a part of our teaching, but I would always include and say, and this is not about the Pope. Uh, this is uh, the confession that comes out of the mouth of Peter. But when you actually read it, there's no question that it's about Peter. It's no question. I mean, of course it is. It's not just his mouth. It's, uh, you know, He's there, and Jesus speaks to him, and says very clearly that, that you uh, are the rock, Peter. You don't care for us, and on this rock, I will build my church. And I always explained away that, uh, those verses, but standing there in St. Peter's, those verses came very much alive. That here, even physically, this, this church is built on Peter. So spiritually, the church is held together built on uh, the ministry of Peter, and a ministry that goes on through time, the Petronian ministry. Uh, and that, that was very, um, it came, uh, the unbroken line from the ancient church until today was overwhelming for me at that very moment. And the reality of this unshakable faith, an unshakable church that has managed to go through time with all the opposition and persecution and obstacles, was built by Christ on the rock Peter. It came upon me almost like a crushing <coughs> evidence that it was so. So we started more and more to realize in depth that the Catholic Church is the original church. It goes back to the original church. It is authentic, and it is a true, it is a true church. Now, that didn't mean that we did not see other Christians as brothers and sisters, or, uh, and still do, of course. But it meant that there was something special about the Catholic Church that actually every Christian needs. It meant to come into fullness of what God wants to give his children. And he gives it, as he always does, in and through his church. His gifts are always given through his church. One thing that fundamentally divides all Christians. I think you know, there are many uh, divisions, but there is basically one deeper division. You can almost count all the different denominations in two distinct camps, and that is the understanding of the sacraments. That grace is conferred sacramentally to us. This is a real dividing line. Some Christians believe it, and some don't. If it, is true, if it is true that the sacraments actually confer grace, give grace, mediate grace, and are not just symbols of grace, and that God is willing to give His grace to us, and using these means 
mediate good grace to us? Then many questions arise. First one is, in what way is grace conferred? Second question, how is the church safeguarding the sacraments if the sacraments confer grace? When are they valid and when they, are they not valid? And of course here we know the Christians differ and there are lots of different opinions about this. But we start to understand that God's grace was truly present in sacraments. The real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist especially became very important to us. That it's biblical, that it's, uh, you can see it very clearly in scripture, you see it very clearly in the early church, and it's been going on with the church all the way up to modern time. So if the Catholic Church taught this, that Christ is actually present in the sacrament, in the Eucharist, he comes to us in a real way, uh, if this is what the church teaches, and if we believe this, we were still outside and could not really fully partake in this grace. This didn't mean that we were not Christians. It meant that we were separated, that the uh, grace that actually comes through the sacraments it's not coming to us on, on a regular basis, uh, the, way, uh, the way that the church has taught it and the way the church has kept it. And uh, in a little bit at that time, uh, years before that, it was not like that. But now uh, there was a thirst and a hunger for the reality of what the body of Christ really is. And one of the answers of what and who is the church is that the church is the body of Christ and the church is sacramental. Uh, that as the incarnation in Jesus Christ, that Christ is tangible, you can, you can uh, touch him, you can uh, see him, you can feel him, you can sense him. Uh, he comes to you uh, in a very real way. Uh, he does so continually through his own body, the church. And the sacraments is a way that God has given us to partake of that grace that Jesus wants to give us. Then we felt we, was, we were almost like outside of a bakery shop. And inside that bakery shop was all kinds of goodies, beautiful, wonderful things. Uh, but uh, there was a glass window. And it doesn't help, and you live in Finland. I tell this story uh, in Australia, they have no idea where they're from, but you live in Finland, and I'm in Sweden. So you know what happens when you put uh, your tongue uh, on an icy window, window at winter time. <laughs> uh, it's stuck. Uh, so uh, it doesn't taste good. You. Uh, had to go through the door to come in to get the uh, uh, to get the goodies on the inside. So for us this was frustrating because clearly if the church is sacramental and if the sacrament is confer grace, now that doesn't mean that we can we, that we not can obtain grace in other ways, not at all. But uh, uh, what the church is, teaches is that this is uh, the major way grace comes to us. Why then we we missed something miss out on something. And, and in my ministry, uh, I really felt I, I need everything that God has to be able to live as a Christian. Every gift he's given, every rich, uh, all riches he has deposited, if he has given them, uh, I would like to, I'd like to partake on them. They help me uh, on my way to full salvation. Because salvation is not just something in the past. We have been saved, yes. We are in the process of being saved also. And one day we will be saved. All these three uh, temples uh, is used in the Bible for the word salvation. If we narrow it down to only one way, we miss something else. And that's a continuation of that salvific process that God is working through uh, his church and his sacraments for us to come to heaven. So, in, in this uh, context, I had four short uh, uh, sentences that came to my heart. And the first one was to discover. The second one was to appreciate what you discovered. The third one was to draw near to that which you discovered. And the fourth one was to join or to unite with that which you have discovered. The fourth one I quickly forgot. <laughs> but the first one, 
discoveries. Beautiful. There are things that I didn't know. I have discovered them. The second one, appreciate what you discover. Don't disdain it. Don't uh, ridicule it. Don't laugh at it. You know, laughing and humor could be a, a very manipulative power play, actually, when you want to push things away that are actually very serious and you need to deal with. So for us, this was precious and beautiful. Uh, and uh, draw closer to it. Yes, that's what we had done. I had my idea that I could be an ecumenical pastor preaching in ecumenical meetings and very happy to everybody and uh, you know, just stay there, a little bit neutral, but just nice to everybody. And uh, it was very unsatisfying. There was a definite pull into something that I, during many years, didn't even want to come close to. But it was there and it was evident. But it was based on free will. It was not a, it was not a, a force that pushed me. It was an invitation that came to me. And uh, as I was becoming more and more open for the Catholic Church, and uh, sometimes uh, our, uh, and I only have a few more uh, things to say, and then I will wrap this up. Uh, uh, sometimes when I voice this publicly, which I did in different uh, lectures or sermons or Bible studies or, or, or uh, seminars, uh, of course there were opposition. Sometimes I would check, I would quote a, a pope, uh, in my Bible service, and, and I would say 99.9% people loved the quotation. I really liked it. And then people came up and said, that was great. I only said, a preacher said this. And then I quoted the book. He's a preacher. <laughs> and then people came up and said, that was a great quote. Who was that? I said, I was John Paul II. Ah! <laughs> 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 it was. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, people started to. Uh, uh, Suspect we uh, spoke about a unity. We took uh, tours to Rome with pastors to uh, befriend uh, Catholic ministries and to see Rome and to listen to the Pope uh, when he spoke and to meet uh, the people out of the preacher, the papal household, the Ranier Candelum, and other Ranier Candelum, and others. And it was a beautiful uh, encounter with Pentecostal ministries and, uh, uh, and, and the Catholic uh, priests. Uh, and others, and laymen as well. Uh, but of course, uh, it got a little bit too Catholic. Uh, and and uh, so people started to criticize us, and I backed off a little bit. Uh, but my wife said, uh, Oh, this is not a question about ministry. It's not a question about even being liked and accepted. It is a question about what is true. What is the truth? Now, if this is true, if this is really true, uh, I want it. If it's not true, I don't want it. And that's probably the same with you, isn't it? Not even an answer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Everybody wants to want the truth. Of course we do. Uh, I'm not saying the truth is simple. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to simplify it. I'm just uh, uh, trying to give uh, a witness of how it came and why we reacted and why we did what we did. I'm not saying there's no problem with the Catholic Church. I don't have starry eyes and say everything is beautiful, wonderful. Ooh. I'm not saying that. But there's something that is real. There's something that is stable. There's something that is strong. There's something that is lasting. There's something that is true. So more and more, as we got convinced about this, we started, of course, getting more resistance and criticism. Uh, the openness we had towards the Catholic Church uh, was not something that people really wanted to hear in my sermons about. Uh, the more uh, I was open, the more deep-seated the criticism of the Catholic faith surfaced. And it was quite astonishing how deep this criticism was rooted, even in people that for sure never, ever had read or studied this subject. So emotions started to run high. We were very convinced that uh, uh, we would not be allowed to be bullied away or silenced of that which we uh, uh, had started to be convinced of, and so we had to, uh, of course, take the heat. But eventually, we started to see that this position really was not acceptable for anyone. It was not acceptable for us. It was not acceptable for the people that thought different than us, but still listened to us. So uh, I was praying and trying to understand uh, God's will in this area, and uh, we also went to a catechism class, 
and we tried to get as much information and knowledge as we could. Uh, I dragged my feet because I thought that we have a movement here. We have not just World of Life in Uppsala uh, with a couple of thousand members. We also have uh, the whole network in Russia, Eastern Europe, and approximately a quarter of a million people from 50,000 people that I feel that I'm in, in some way responsible for. Uh, I have retired at this time, uh, and we put in a new pastor in World of Life, but still uh, people uh, wanted my advice and so forth. Uh, so I felt maybe we should do this later. Maybe it should. Uh, maybe we should wait. So I dragged my feet. Then one night, two o'clock in the morning, I woke woke up fully clear. And you, I think you have. I'm sure you have an experience like that. You wake up and you're so clear in your mind, and you know that somebody wants to speak to you. And I just heard in my heart these little simple words: "It is time." Throw yourself into the water. And then it came. You can either go the way of the prophet Jonah or the way of the apostle Peter. Well, I didn't want to go Jonah's way because Jonah run, ran away from God. He ran away from God's calling. He got in all kinds of trouble. He got water very high up. He went very deep. Uh, and eventually, you know, through circumstances, he, he was forced to do God's will. And uh, I didn't want that. So I said, clearly, I want Peter's way. You know, Peter stepped out to the water, and, and, and the word of Jesus, come, clearly <laughs> held him, even when the storm came. And Jesus rescued him and took him to himself. So this was my experience. Okay, I waited maybe too long. I fell asleep very peacefully. I know, okay, my dragging of feet and procrastination now is over. We made up our mind, we prayed, we were in total unity and in joy. And eventually we told our congregation the 9th of March 2014. And then, uh, a few months later, the, the um, 21st of May 2014, we were received in the Catholic Church. Well, in the media storm that erupted, we actually felt very peaceful. We felt the peace of God and the protection of the Lord. And a very deeply rooted conviction that this was God's will for us, that this was the way He was leading us. But I must say, I did not feel that it was just a subjective choice for us alone, but that it was built on objective truth that the Catholic Church is the Church of Jesus Christ with His fullness, and to unite with it is the desire that Jesus has for all of us. In his prayer and in his heart, he prays that all God's children who are scattered and divided will be united in Christ, in his church. So this is how we eventually ended up.